pleasure to be with you this evening. Well, it's an honor, an honor to have you here, and, and I've got to ask the question that I'm sure everyone in the audience has been wondering about, uh, and is it all right if I call you boss? I prefer TJ. TJ, okay. Well, TJ, I want to ask the question that, that everybody here, I'm sure it's on everybody's lips, uh, and that is, you know, we've, we've renovated parts of our city in, in recent years, including uh, reconstructing uh, Brush Creek, and, <laughs> and, and we all want to know, what did you do with the bodies? I don't know anything about bodies, but I do know that that was awfully good concrete. I'll put my concrete up against anything that goes down later for length of time, you name it. And you know, there's some of my concrete that's still there. As I was flying here this evening, you know, we spirits can do these things. <laughs> I noticed that just east of Truce, there's about a block's worth of my concrete still intact. So if you want to get a picture, you have to get down off the bridge, but it's uh, just to east of Troost and uh, between 47th and uh, Mr. Volker's Boulevard, I believe. Well, you know, this is so interesting. I, 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 hadn't, I hadn't intended to start with, with concrete as the, as the concrete subject of the evening, but since, since we're on this subject, let me ask, is it true that when you laid the concrete, when the Ready Mix Company, the Pendergast Ready Mix Company, laid the concrete for the municipal airport, that the first runway actually has 24 highway miles of concrete. Well, it's the only way that we knew that the increasing weight of these big birds would be able to land properly. We needed to make sure that it was fully reinforced. And the extra concrete, I think, really adds to that in the long term, don't you? It and this, this is a good lead into my next question. The Pendergast family. I'm, I'm is, glad I can be helpful to you. Thank here. you. It's very helpful. The Pendergast family is obviously an Irish family. Um, oh? <laughs> Tell me a little bit about the beginnings of your, of your family. Your brother, Jim Pendergast, who was the first well known Pendergast in, in, in Kansas City. Uh, you, your family came from St. Joseph, Missouri, uh, poor background. Uh, your brother, your brother started out in the in the West Bottoms uh, as a puddler for the uh, for the for the the uh, uh, Keystone Iron Works. Keystone Iron Works in the iron business, but he but he but he made he had a huge success and 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 bought a saloon. Now there's a story that it's all related to a horse race and a and a horse called Climax. Is this true? Well, it is. It's the story as Jim told it. And it had to do with a day very much like this. It was a Saturday, and he'd gotten his pay envelope from the ironworks, and as was his wont, he would go to the track. And he got word when he got there that there it was a really good mudder in the fourth race, and there was a filly named Climax. So he put what money he had on her, and she came in, 40 to 1. And he was able to buy the American house, his room and house, and then later he could put in his saloon in the front room. And, and the saloon was called the Climax Saloon? So, so the story is told. Well, that I, uh, we referred to it that way. I don't know that it ever showed up in the city directory that way, but it was, it was the Climax Saloon as far as we were concerned. And, and yet it was a climax and it was the beginning at the same time because it was the beginning of, of a great political career. How did your brother and eventually you, how did, how did you use this saloon and the, 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 uh, the hotel that was associated with it, how did you use that to build a political machine? Well, I don't know about political machines. All I know is I've got a lot of friends. <laughs> but the thing that Jim did was exactly that. He made friends with people. When they would get off work, and they get their pay envelopes, usually on a noon time, or sometimes it was five o'clock on Saturday. You know, in those days they got paid in money, not paychecks, and they didn't trust banks, with good reason. <laughs> Sir, please so don't bank would, holding here. So what they would do is they'd bring their money to the saloon, and uh, Jim would uh, certainly serve them a drink or two, and then. Uh, they would put the balance of their money in the saloon for him to keep for safe, you know, for when they'd need it later on. 
Sometimes they would want to drink a little more than a drink or two, and he'd tell them, now, wait a minute. You know, Molly back home needs some of that money to pay for the kids' lunches for next week and, and uh, for everything else, including the rent. Now, sometimes the fellow didn't really appreciate that, but Molly did. And when it came time to vote, Molly reminded him. And that was very important. Well, and, and it said that the Climax Saloon, or the, the, uh, the American House, uh, was, was uh, down in the West Bottoms, close to the, to the Union Depot. Mm -hmm. And that, that in, in that era, in the 1880s and 1890s, there were, there were many immigrants to, uh, to Kansas City, Irish and Italian immigrants, or, or people from Iowa. A lot of uh, Germans. <laughs> And, and, uh, and, and when they got off the, the, the train at the Union Depot, the, the first saloon nearby was the Climax Saloon or the, the American House, and, and they, they would come for, for advice and counsel. Is that true? Well, it's, it's not exactly true. If they'd wanted to get one right of across the street, they'd have gone to the Blossom House. We were about two blocks off of that. We were over on St. Louis Avenue. So actually what would happen is that our clientele were the people that worked in the bottoms. Wasn't, wasn't so much the folks passing through, but you're quite right in that especially a lot of the Irish families and German families and others that would come uh, got, got settled down there. And we had, uh, uh, well, the, the Catholic Church started the, uh, the parish down there, and by the time uh, I started visiting Jim in the 1880s, they had 2,000 people in their parish there at, uh, at Annunciation Parish. And, and, and it's, it's said, it's said, TJ, if I, if I may call you, you indeed, TJ, uh, it, it's said that, that you and your brother operated was essentially a, a welfare operation, that the, the Chamber of Commerce, the commercial club, as it was then called, uh, decided in the 1890s, in the Great Depression in the 1890s, that they wouldn't uh, become a charitable organization. They wouldn't help out the poor and the destitute, the people who'd been thrown out of work by the by the Great Depression of the 1890s, and that you stepped in, or, or your brother initially, and then you as you, as you got involved. Well, we're, the, the idea is that's making friends. And if you got friends in trouble, you try to help them. And sometimes if you need a little help, usually around election time, <laughs> they're there to help you. So I, I didn't view it as welfare. I just viewed it as common sense and being friends. It, it, so it sounds like an, an intelligent way uh, to build an organization, to build, to build a group of friends, become, becomes an organization. But eventually it did become an organization, and your brother became uh, uh, an alderman out of, the, out of the first ward, the first ward where the, the bottoms, uh, 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 et cetera, uh, was. And, and, and what, what, was, what was he interested in that he became involved in politics, and how did you become involved in politics? What was your, what was your first job working for your brother in politics? Well, my first job when I came down in about 1895 was uh, just working for Jim in the, in the saloon. But my first political job was about 1898. And actually, my brother Mike helped me to get that one. I was a deputy um, uh, constable for the uh, area. And we had constables and we had sheriffs in those days. And then we had marshals. And so I worked my way up from being the deputy constable to being the deputy marshal. And that was the job of getting the prisoners back and forth between the jail and the courtrooms. Uh, so that was, a, uh, that was an important job. But really, what turned it around for me was in 1900. Jim Reed got elected mayor. And my brother, Jim, was very important in getting that done. And so Jim Reed asked him, well, what, what can I do for you? You've been so helpful to me. And my brother said, I want you to name my youngest brother Tom to be the street superintendent for Kansas City. Now I know it didn't sound like much, but the fact was the street superintendent appointed more people to work for the city than anybody besides the mayor himself. It was a good deal. And, and, and those people owed you something, didn't they? Well, they were appreciative. <laughs> In fact, it said, is, is, isn't it, TJ, that, that, that people who held city jobs were frequently asked by the Pendergast organization to donate 50% of their salaries oh, to the Jackson yeah. Democratic Club? No, sir, never, never 50%. <laughs> 10% maybe. 
Uh, tithing. Tithing, exactly. You, you know, 10% for the, the church, 10% for, for maintaining good contacts. Do, you're doing the Lord's work. Tithing is appropriate. Absolutely. That's well, right. you mentioned Jim Reed, who was the mayor, eventually became the, uh, the senator from, uh, from Missouri, the great, great senator. But he said at one point when, when, he, was, when he was mayor, he told a, uh, a correspondent, he said, a man who takes political office is mortgaged for the rest of his life. What does he mean by that? Well, I think what he's saying is that uh, if you're in political office, there's always a little bit to somebody else. It's one of the reasons that I didn't run for political office very much in my life. I've run for two different political offices, one of which was the county marshal. That was in 1902. I won, and then I lost in 1904. Most people know I didn't, don't know that I actually lost an election, but I did. Then in 1910, when Jim decided he wasn't going to run for city council anymore, uh, he asked me to run in his place for the first ward position, and I did. And I stayed with that until we built our house. I uh, had Mr. Nichols build our house for us out at 54th and Wyandotte, and we moved out of the ward in 1915. I haven't held political office since. Now, you, you, you mentioned J.C. Nichols, and I've heard the story, T.J., I've heard the story that when you went out for your final house, not, not the 54th and Wyandotte house, but your final mm -hmm. house at 5650 Ward Parkway, mm -hmm. which still stands today. Carolyn's uh, house. Carolyn's, Carolyn's house, mm -hmm. Mrs. Pendergast, for those of you. Uh, Mrs. Pendergast's house, that, that when you talked to Mr. Nichols about buying the lot, that you had your eye on the lot, he told you what it, what, what it was worth, that it was. It was in that neighborhood. Something, something like that. A lot of money at the time that you said, I'll take it and peeled out $51,000 bills. Is that correct? He got very nervous with that. He told me, <laughs> he told me he'd been mugged on the street. And I said, okay, fine. Let's take the, uh, let's take the money and we'll go over to, uh, it was your uncle's bank is what it was. We went over to Commerce. <laughs> and... Um, we deposited it there, and you know, we didn't get mugged on the way. Uh, that, that, is, that is a great story. Now, I, want to, I do want to go back to the, to the politics of this, because it, 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 as you say, in 1904, you, you lost. It, it wasn't actually a, a, a complete control of the machine in the early days of your political career. Uh, not only were the Republicans occasionally able to, to win uh, in, in Kansas City, something that in, in recent history I, I recognize not something that, uh, that we understand, but uh, it, 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 the, the Democrats were frequently split. There were the rabbits and the goats. And can you tell us the origins of the rabbits? Who were the rabbits and who were the goats and why were they called the rabbits and the goats? Well, the rabbits were the followers of Joe Shannon. Joe Shannon was the arch enemy of my brother Jim. Joe Shannon was an Irishman who didn't drink. <laughs> you can't trust an Irishman that doesn't drink. <laughs> Nonetheless, the reason that we got being called goats and rabbits had very much practical points to make with regard to voting. You know, in, in the general election, you'd have a paper ballot, and there'd be the Republican column, and they'd have an elephant's head at the top, and the Democratic column, they'd have a donkey's head at the top. Well, in the Democratic primary, and, and remember that this is around 1900, and it's paper ballots are a brand new thing in those days. But in the primary ballot, you, you know, if you're both Democrats, you can't use the donkey's head at the top. So what you've got to do is to come up with a symbol. Shannon's boys decided they wanted to be rabbits. So that's what they put at the top of their, their column was the, the head of a rabbit. And they told the voters, for their, their guys, to cross out the rabbit, and that would vote straight ticket for their nominees. Our side, we put the head of a goat, so we told them, vote for the goat. Well, a lot of the fellows who were voting didn't read too well, <laughs> if at all, and so they could see the picture, and that
There was a story about the idea of, of the rabbits over in the eighth and ninth wards, that, which was where Joe had his strong point, that uh, they were uh, uh, running over the grass, and so that was, uh, gave them the idea of using the rabbit's head. Uh, now, the irony of our using the goat is that Joe Shannon very frequently would make a great show of drinking goat's milk instead of Irish whiskey. Hard to understand that. Hard to understand entirely, but I think he was making fun of us is what I think he was doing. Well, that was I, his problem. And I, and I promise I won't do that here tonight. Um, I appreciate that, sir. Thank you. And I want to talk a little bit more about the machine and how, how it worked. You, you were quoted once as saying that the, an efficient, I think this is right after you went to visit Italy under Mussolini, but uh, you, you said an efficient political organization run intelligently uh, provides a service to the state. And the fewer people you have running anything, the better it is for the poor. Now, do you really believe that, TJ? Absolutely. I think that it is necessary to look out for those folks who are, are having a bit of a time of it. And they want somebody to look out for. Them. But they don't necessarily want somebody who's going to tell them everything that they've got to do. You know, this thing about reformers these days, you can call them Republicans too if you want to, but <laughs> this, and, and, and I'm talking about, you know, when I'm involved in things, the, the, the thing that they want to do is they want to help you, but they want to tell you all the things that you've got to do. We don't do that. We help people, and then when it comes to election time, we make it clear what our position is, and they want to help us. I think that's just a very common human response, don't you? Well, abs absolutely, and, I, and I'm sure you, 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 you did some good. There, there are stories of, of uh, how you, you brought turkeys to, uh, to, to, to poor people, destitute people, uh, at Christmas time and, and, and Thanksgiving, and, and the, the messenger boys who worked for your hurry, what was it called, the hurry and... Hurry, hasty, and uh, just the hurry and hasty and messenger speedy. service. Hurry, hurry hasty, hasty, and speedy. speedy. I'm sorry, thank hurry, you. Hurry, hasty, and speedy. Well, the, so the, speedy the, part, speedy. the speedy part was Kaz Welch's part, and it wasn't very speedy. Right, well. But the hurry and hasty boys worked for me. They, they were, and, and you, you did well by those messenger boys. You, you always brought them turkeys at Christmas. And tell, us, tell us about some of your other accomplishments. What did the machine really accomplish? I, you know, I've heard that maybe in 1893 your brothers supported William Rockhill Nelson and August Meyer when they tried to create the Parks and Boulevard system, for instance. That's, well, that, that's that, that proposal unusual. certainly made sense from the standpoint that it created jobs, it created work. Uh, it was the same reason that he wanted me a street superintendent in 1900, because we could put our folks to work on those projects, and, and it was a very important deal. Now, I, I think that one of the main things that we've done, uh, my organization has done for Kansas City, is to provide really a better place to live and the opportunity to make a living in it. You know, in 1930, we knew we were in the midst of a Great Depression in this city. And so were all the other cities in the country. But they didn't know what to do about it. We knew what to do about it. We proposed the 10-year plan. And the 10-year plan was that we were going to build public buildings. We were going to improve the streets and roads in the city and the county. And we were going to put up a, a new courthouse here in Kansas City and remodel the one in Independence. By the way, if you've ever noticed on the plaque on the one in Independence, you go down to the bottom, there's a Wallace name who's one of the architects on that. Harry's brother-in-law. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and we'll, we'll get to Harry in, in a second, but I want to, do want to talk about the public works and the bond. You mentioned the bond issue. Yes. And there's a family story in, in my story which does, as, you, as you've indicated, have an interesting uh, relationship with, uh, with your family over the, over the years. And it was said by my grandfather, I actually heard my grandfather say this uh, once, that he opposed the 1928 bond issue, uh, the 10-year plan. And, uh, and he found a street crew uh, the next day, as soon as he had announced this at the, uh, the chamber of the commercial club, that he was opposed to this for, for economic reasons, that, that a street crew, uh, a city street crew, appeared outside of his house uh, and blocked his driveway for the next three months. 
and, and, until he agreed that perhaps the bond issue was a good idea, in which, and they, ah. they immediately evaporated. Could this possibly be true? Well, he, he wised up, didn't he? <laughs> he saw the light. He certainly saw the light. Well, there you have it. Well, well there you have it. Now, now, now tell me, there, surely there is a downside to the, uh, the kind of organization that, that you created, the, 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 the great democratic political organization in, in, in Kansas City. It, it's, it's said that, that you were the most corrupt political organization in America. There were, well, well for instance, the 1914 election. In the 1914 election, it was said that uh, the, the, uh, the Pendergast candidate for, for mayor in one precinct received a vote of 258 to 1, and that might not be all that surprising, except there were actually 63 votes from a one-room apartment. <laughs> now, conditions were different then, but surely there, you know, there, there, there was a certain amount of what, what we might today call plural voting. Well, there was... Uh, there was the necessity to make sure that the best fellows got elected to office that could possibly be elected. And sometimes you have to make sure that happens by getting some other fellows to go to several precincts and occasionally use other names than possibly their own in the pursuit of the greater good. Well, you know, this this reminds me of the story of Dan Rostenkowski. That was a you know very Dan who? Dan Rostenkowski after your time, okay. uh, Alderman Pendergast, but, but a famous Chicago politician from another great organization, the Daily Organization. It was said he got into some political trouble, some trouble in Washington, and it was said when he was uh, actually defeated for for re-election that the moment he knew that he was defeated is when the votes from the cemetery started to go against him. <laughs> A very perceptive man, I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now it's, it's said that there were certain techniques that your, uh, your fellows used uh, in, in these elections. Uh, there was the, uh, the, the substitute ballot box, for instance. Do you, do you, do you, can you tell us about that? Well, you know, if, if you turn in the, re the, the summary of the votes and don't really pay much attention to the ballot box, you don't have to substitute anything. <laughs> And, and we found that that worked fairly well in certain instances. And, and, Don't quote me on that. And then, and then there was the, 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 the changing hats. Do you, you remember that, that story where, where there were folks who were lined up to vote, and they would yeah. come in and vote, and they'd come back out, and a member of your organization would hand them a new, a different hat, and they'd go back through the line again to vote, and you just know... Well, one of the keys to that, of course, is that you need to make sure that the election judges are on your side. <laughs> At which point, sometimes you don't even have to change hats. <laughs> now this is true. Now, now there, there are stories. There are, there are stories about election judges being intimidated, uh, indeed, and, and, and voters being intimidated. In fact, there's a story of one polling place that was open uh, for about five minutes, uh, and a voter came in early in the morning, 6:35 in the morning, to vote, and and the uh, uh, the member of the machine said. Well, sir, you've already been here. You can't, you can't vote. You're, you're trying to, to vote a second time. But this can't possibly have happened, can it? Well, I said earlier about voting early and often. That's the early part. <laughs> what you want to do is you want to get to the polling place early, and you vote for folks who probably aren't going to get there. 635 is cutting a little close. You really want to vote for the people who aren't going to get there until about 10, and then they will be surprised. Yeah. And, 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 and tell me, is it, is it true that by the 1930s, when you had complete control of the organization and the ballot boxes in, in Kansas City, you were able to turn out 75,000 votes or, or more in, in pluralities in any given uh, statewide election, and that, that might have had something to do with uh, uh, the favorable treatment by the voters, uh, Harry Truman, for instance? Well, in, in Harry's case, in, in 1934, Was, was John Cochran from St. Louis. And uh, the fact was that, uh, you know, they really do resurrect their voters over there in St. Louis. And so what we were able to do in that election 
1934 is we actually had more total votes for Harry coming out of Kansas City and Jackson County than they did for Cochran coming out of St. Louis and St. Louis County. And they had twice the population over there. <laughs> well, I, I understand that there's one ward, East Side, uh, East Side Ward, uh, Cass Welch's ward, uh, Little Tammany, where in 1925, the last uh, supposedly more or less, uh, how should we say, open election, uh, there were 3,300 votes cast. In 1930, once you got control, there were 16,000 votes cast. Uh, and uh, uh, it, 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 there was a 15,000, sorry, 21,000 vote advantage for, uh, for FDR uh, in 1932 uh, in, in a, uh, a ward that had cast only 3,000 votes in 1925. You well, did, you, you were owed a lot by the there were, president. You know, there had been lots of children in 1925, and several of them had matured. But the reality is that uh, it's very important in an election uh, to make sure that uh, you really do have the majorities that are going to make things work. And in the 1932 election, don't you agree that it was important that Mr. Roosevelt be elected president? I think he was a wonderful president in a lot of ways. Absolutely. You're, you're Absolutely. choosing your words carefully. Sir. Well, I, you know, I want you to know my great grandfather, as you know, because he helped you so much, was the Democratic National Committeeman uh, at that at that time. And, and uh, yeah, and of course you know that Jim Reed was an unfailing opponent. Of well, and tell us uh, in 1932 you delivered the Missouri delegation for for FDR, and yet the favorite son of the Missouri delegation was your own. Uh, henchman, uh, the fine mayor and senator from Missouri, Jim Reed. Uh, be careful of your words, sir. Uh, well, sir, uh, uh, Mr. Reed is a, is a uh, I, I married into the Reed family, so I, I want you to know he's related to him by marriage, but uh, he's probably a great man. But he was a favorite son, and yet you were able to, uh, to, to get favor with uh, President Roosevelt by delivering the delegation. Tell us how you did that. Well, basically, and, and, and quite honestly, I, I had a little more difficulty with Mrs. Donnelly. She was kind of leading the, the charge for Mr. Reed there at the convention there in 1932. They were neighbors, you know, back across the back fence. And, and the fact was that uh, she was uh, rousing the, the, the troops. But I knew it was important for Missouri that we be behind the winning candidate. and it, was becoming clear. It didn't happen, of course, on the first ballot, but it was becoming clear that that was going to be Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I didn't want to be in a position where just because Mr. Reed was rather stubbornly trying to hang on to something that he couldn't succeed in, that we would be placed at a great disadvantage in the future. So for the good of Missouri, I privately spoke to Mr. Reed uh, that uh, we were going to need to move the delegation to Mr. Roosevelt's column uh, very quickly. He was not entirely in favor, but he understood the practice. And, and uh, we all know, of course, that Harry Truman owed you, owed you a lot, but, but Franklin Roosevelt used to call you, I think, and, and talk to you periodically. And In fact, did, didn't some good things happen for Missouri in terms of patronage and the the WPA and the Triple C and, and the other New Deal programs because of your relationship with the president? Well, I think that it, all of those made a difference. You know, the WPA in the long run was really modeled after what we have done in the 10-year plan here in Kansas City. <laughs> I, you, you, you laugh, but think about it. The purpose of the WPA was to build public buildings and improve uh, the uh, various public facilities and to put people back to work in the process. Exactly what we've been doing from 1931 forward. The WPA didn't come along until 1935. Well, all those great public buildings, the city hall, the county courthouse built by Harry Truman, uh, the music hall and, and auditorium, et cetera, it's all, all built during that, that era. That's right. Help from the president, help from uh, uh, the county executive, Harry Truman. Tell, tell us about your relationship with him. How did, how did your relationship with Harry Truman happen? Well, to begin with, you're, you're throwing your glasses away, sir. It's <laughs> a it, climax saloon at it, work again. It happens. <laughs> well, the reality, what happened was this. I didn't know him. 
But in 1922, we were trying for the first time in a really organized way to have some influence in the county court, which was the administrative court in, in those days. And uh, they, uh, we hadn't ever really had much success. I suggested that the Western judge candidate that we support should be a fellow named Henry McElroy, who was a real estate fellow in town that I knew, and I thought he would be very good. But I had no clue as far as anything out in the county. Now, Mike had worked in the courthouse a good deal. This is my brother, Mike. And, uh, and he told me that his boy, Jim, had served in the Great War with um, a, a fellow that had been born down to Grandview, but was living in Independence, married to an Independence woman, and uh, had a clothing store here in Kansas City now. So I said, fine, go talk to him. They did. And uh, quite honestly, I don't know that we did a whole lot to get Harry elected in that particular election. He was running mostly uh, because uh, he was in the Army. His war buddies did a great deal of the job that year uh, with it. But in 1924, it didn't matter what we did. We weren't going to win in that particular election. Uh, Harry got visited by the, the Klan organizer in 24. Did he tell you about that? I, I, heard, I heard that the Klan was a very important part of that election. Well, in 24, the Klan was active all over this part of the country. In fact, in October of that year, right over yonder at the convention hall, they had their national convention held here in Kansas City, Missouri. And they marched around in their white sheets and their pointy hats. And of course, we know that the Klan, you know, didn't like Negroes. It also didn't like Catholics. And it didn't like Jews. Now, I didn't know much about the latter category, but I found out that Harry's clothing store partner was a Jewish fellow. Anyway, uh, this organizer had come to Harry and said, you know, Mr. Truman, we'll back you in this election if you'll sign a pledge that you're not going to hire any of those types of fellows to work for the county. And he shot right back at him. He said, I served in the war with Catholics and with Jewish fellows, and I'm not about to tell anybody that's qualified that they can't have a job with the county. So he didn't get the endorsement, and he didn't get reelected. Neither did Mr. McElroy, for that matter which made him available for another job later on. Absolutely. <laughs> now, I, one thing I want to know about Harry Truman as county executive, it, it, you, you owned the Ready Mix Concrete Company. You were a partner in the Ross Construction Company. It's pretty well known that you participated in most of the city contracts of the, of the era and, and any of the uh, independent contracts where they required city permits. Uh, and and th therefore, you had a certain advantage. But, when Harry became the, the, uh, the county executive, the primary county executive, he became the great road builder in America. It said that, uh, that, that only Wayne County, Detroit, and Westchester County built more roads per capita than Jackson County while Harry Truman was county executive. But, but I understand you didn't get all the contracts. Well, that's a, a very interesting thing. I wasn't aware that, uh, that we were right up there behind Wayne County and Westchester in New York. But uh, you should read a book. Well. <laughs> I leave that to the, to the writers and the authors. Uh, but th what I did know uh, is that, yes, Harry was very dedicated to this. His, you know, his father had been a road overseer here in Jackson County. And uh, Harry was very proud of uh, his interest in terms of that. No, I didn't, I didn't press for all the contracts. We had a meeting shortly after Harry went in as the presiding judge. And uh, it was attended by Willie Ross and by uh, Bill Boyle and Jimmy Pryor and myself and Harry. Well, they wanted to make sure that they were going to get all the contracts. And Harry looked back at him straight in the eye, and he said, if you fellas provide the best materials at the lowest price, you'll get the contract. Well, I saw Willie Ross just sputter. That wasn't what he wanted to hear. And I thought for a moment, and I just sort of laughed, and I said to uh, the contractors, I said, didn't I tell you he was the contrariest Missouri mule you'd ever find? Now, they did get their share of contracts after that, but so did a lot of other fellows. 
I do understand that there was a visit with the other fellows after they got the contract that made it known that there was a cost of doing business in Jackson County. And there was a 10% um, <laughs> overhead, shall we say, <laughs> that was due. Otherwise, it might be a little difficult to get the workers to show up on time. It might be a little hard to find the exact piece of equipment they needed on a given day. Unless, of course, they, they rented it from Dixie Equipment Company. And, and you had an interest in Dixie Equipment Company, I understand. Uh, my, uh, my treasurer, uh, Ernst Schneider, tells me that I do, yes. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, the county executive Truman once, once said that the boss, meaning you, had, had told them that the bids were doctored so the inside gentleman, it's nice that he called them gentlemen, the inside gentleman always got the contract. So it's, it's interesting to hear you, hear you talk about that. Uh, let me ask you about some of your other business uh, activities, though. Uh, the, the story of the Riverside Jockey Club, you always had an interest in horses. Horses was... A, Betting on the horses uh, seemed to always be an interest of yours. In fact, I, I've, I've heard that you might wager as, and lose as much as $20,000 on an individual race or $100,000 in a given month. Which of my bookies you've been talking to? <laughs> my, 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 my sources must remain anonymous. But is this true, uh, TJ? Well, you know, a fellow who's in a position like I'm in has got to find some way to have a little bit of release from the, the stress of the day. And I found that, oh, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it's kind of an enjoyable thing to get the handicap sheets and go over it and uh, put a little money on the line. Now, I wouldn't, you, you're speaking in thousands of dollars, I don't really want to go that strong on it, but I would, I have been known to occasionally be enthusiastic about a particular horse. I've also been known occasionally to be wrong in my enthusiasm. <laughs> Sometimes more often wrong than right. Is that well, and, and, and you, you, uh, you, you uh, in more than one way, you invested in this uh, the, the horse racing game. There was the Riverside Jockey Club, which was the great uh, Kansas City uh, uh, horse uh, uh, track uh, in, in, the, in the 20s. And in 1927, the Supreme Court of Missouri outlawed gambling on horses, horse race gambling. And yet you found a, a, a noble, in a noble experiment, you found a way to continue to encourage people to, to attend uh, the greatest. Well, we, we wanted to improve the breed. And <laughs> the way that that could happen was that if you were at the, the Riverside uh, Club, you could, uh, we had two windows, uh, and you could uh, actually choose to improve the particular breed of a certain horse. And you would put your money on that, and if the horse won, then it proved that the breed had improved <laughs> rather quickly. And you got some return on your investment. Uh, a, a truly remarkable and, and, and imaginative response to a Supreme Court decision. Well, we were not entirely alone in this, but uh, we, we were probably the most successful track in working on that basis. Well, I, I, I admire your, your creativity, and, and, I, and, I, and I want to talk a, a little bit more. I want you to talk a little bit more about some of the other forms. And Kansas City was known during the Pendergast era, if we may call it that, if you'll allow us to call it that, as the most wide open city in America. There was not only gambling or horse breeding investing, uh, as you might call it, at the horse track, there were other forms of gambling and, and what we might today call, call vice, but was then called uh, entertainment. Uh, it, tell us about, for instance, the Chesterfield Club. Well, the Chesterfield Club was a, was a fine establishment. It was uh, one that uh, one did need to have the right card to, uh, to get into. I, it wasn't really the card that you were displaying, but uh, that might work. You never know. I, I do have a couple in my pocket here, thanks to a certain gentleman this evening. But the uh, fact is that uh, uh, you all have been to the Chesterfield Club, have you not? You know that the waitresses wear high heels, <laughs> period. <laughs> Carolyn doesn't want me to go there. 
And I understand there was uh, gambling and uh, other activities in, in the back, and, and it was it was the place to go in Kansas City. It was where, the, where gentlemen had their, their business lunches. And well, it was, uh, and also the, the, the jazz clubs that existed. Uh, they were all, I mean, the jazz music was really designed to get people into the door. Once they were in the door, then, of course, they would want to buy a drink to enjoy the, uh, the hospitality of the day. And then uh, they might want to have a little company while they had that drink, usually of the female persuasion. And then if uh, they wanted to uh, uh, do a little gambling, then that was usually in the back room or down in the basement or maybe upstairs. So all those things could happen in, uh, in those clubs. What, do, you, do you think, uh, would you take some credit then for the, 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 what's known as maybe the, the, the greatest era in, in Kansas City, the, the era of Kansas City jazz, 18th and Vine, do you think that had something to do with, uh, with the, uh, the open nature of the city that you, uh, you ran? Well, I don't know that I would want to take credit, but I do think that it has attracted a lot of people. Do you know, right in the, in the midst of the, of the Depression, we were actually the third busiest convention center in the United States after New York and Chicago right here in Kansas City, and our convention hall. And then, of course, we, we built the Municipal Auditorium to take the place of the convention hall, and it uh, served very well. Well, and, and that, that certainly is true. And Kansas City was a, perhaps did better in the, uh, relatively speaking, it's all relative in the Depression than many other cities because of the openness of the city and, and attractions of the, of the city and the public works that you were responsible for, but there were other things going on that maybe you had some relationship to. For instance, tell us about your relationship with Johnny Lazio. Well, John came to my attention in 1928. I had for many years worked with a fellow that actually started with my older brother Jim. Uh, John uh, was, in a sense, a Johnny come lately, you might say. Now, Mike Ross had been our fellow in charge uh, of the North End, and Mike Ross had been a grocer up there for, for many years, and uh, he then got elected to be the Justice of the Peace. So uh, he had his own lieutenants that uh, particularly was, were you know, influential in the Italian community and with the other folks, because the North End is by no means all Italian. But uh, what happened is that uh, what do you have on your floor here, sir? Anyway, uh, the, what would happen is that... Uh, I would have a Pendergast contractor cleaning it, obviously. <laughs> Sanitary service company? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We'll hire him tomorrow. Uh, well, please do. The, uh, the fact is that uh, Mr. Ross, on uh, a certain election day in 1928, discovered that his fellows all of a sudden were no longer at the polling places, and there were some people loyal to Mr. Lazia who were at the polling places. Now, I was a little concerned about this, but that evening, uh, Mr. Lazia came and visited me, and he made it clear that, uh, my, that Mike's people had not been harmed. I think one of them did have a bullet go by as fast as ear, but he was not harmed. And uh, the rest uh, were, uh, were safe, uh, but we needed to come to some agreement. And uh, judging by the situation, I thought that was a logical thing to do. Uh, Mike and I worked out other business arrangements. He was with me in the concrete company, and uh, uh, Willie Ross was his boy. So uh, we worked together in terms of that contracting business as well. But in the long term, uh, John uh, proved to be, uh, for the next few years, a, uh, a, a good, loyal compatriot, especially in the North End, until, of course, he came to his end. Well, I mean, time things end. happened, uh, you know, there were, in 1933, there was a little unpleasantness at Union Station that, that was linked to, to him and... and well, I don't, know that, I don't know that that was uh, accurate at all, and, and certainly was not accurate in being linked to me at all, but I'm not sure that it was really linked to... Who is Vern Miller, uh, and uh, people do a lot of guilt by association. You know. That'd be Machine Gun Miller, I think. No, 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 not uh, you're thinking of someone else, yeah. but uh, Machine Gun boy. Kelly, I think. Yeah. Uh, but no, Vern Miller, uh, I think uh, people well, disagree about who was there that day, but most of them agree that Vern was there. 
Right, and and but all, all these people had uh, some relationship to uh, to people who had relationships to you. And in, in 1934, in the in the 1934 election, Johnny Lazia's Tufts roughed up a lot of people. In fact, there were maybe four people who were actually killed in that that election who were working for the wrong team, and 11 people who went to the hospital. But those weren't all working for John. There were about three of them working for Cas. For Cas Wel uh, Welch, Casimir mm -hmm. Welch, who, uh, who w was occasionally a part of a part of your organization and then and then Johnny Lazi got into some trouble with uh, with the law over various various things and and income not, tax evasion income tax evasion the subject we'll come to again in a minute um, I was afraid you would okay and 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 and, I, and I've got to say that he met an untimely end and there were there were people who thought you might have had something to do with it uh, but they were wrong now I had nothing to do with 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 John's demise uh, now he was killed uh, very sadly and brutally uh, attacked as he was getting out of his car there at the Park Central Hotel on, on Armour. Now, there's a little irony in that. I don't know if you knew this, but Mike Ross's house is not two blocks from that location where John Lazia was gunned down. Mike had nothing to do with it. He swore to me the next day. But he was, he was living up at the corner of Locust and Armour. And uh, it was just not, not two blocks away where that particular tragedy happened. But I, was, I, I received word from Doc Nigro, who was there you know, helping to try to do something for Lazia. He, he called me and he said, you know, uh, John's very low, but he sends you his love. <laughs> and I, I appreciated that. It was there Be awesome. Better than what he sent to a lot of people, for sure. But, uh, well, you know, in the 1930s, things kind of changed. I mean, there's this total domination of Kansas City politics of, of the Pendergast machine. But at the same time, there seems you, 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 you developed some other interests. You went with your, your uh, lovely wife, Carolyn, to, to Europe a number of times. You built this house at 5650 Ward Parkway, which still, still stands. And, did, did you lose interest in politics as the 30s wore along? I mean, did it, did, were, were you interested in becoming a part of Kansas City society? Were you interested in, 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 uh, in becoming something different and new? Well, I, I think that Carolyn always wanted to be a part of the country club in some ways. We, you know, when we built our house, or, or had Mr. Nichols build it for us there at 54th and Wyandotte, we were only a couple of blocks off of Warnell. And uh, at that time, this was 1915, uh, the country club was where Loose Park is now. And um, uh, I think she was hoping that, you know, by living close to it, we might get invited. I didn't have any illusions about that myself. But on the other hand, uh, Carolyn was, Carolyn wanted us to be respected. Uh, I wanted us to be respected, but I think we had different definitions of the term <laughs> in, in some respects. Uh, Carolyn is a great mother and always concerned about the welfare of Marceline and Tom Jr. and Eileen. And we're very proud of them, by the way. Uh, Marceline married a brunette, and uh, Tom Jr. Jr. married uh, Margaret Wire, and uh, Eileen uh, married young Tom Houlihan. Got the clothing store down to the plaza, you know. Absolutely. Well, dur during this period, you're often in, in Europe and, and uh, traveling a lot and, and uh, uh, building your house on, on Ward Parkway. And, and the 1936 election comes along, and there are some concern that, that maybe more people voted uh, than actually were alive at the time. Um, and then there was a great uh, scandal with regard to uh, some insurance contracts, which the, uh, the Internal Revenue Service became interested in. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your, your view of your commissions on these insurance contracts? Well, it was a straightforward transaction. I had a gentleman from Chicago uh, come to me, and uh, he suggested that uh, there was a situation as far as some premium money for insurance policies that uh, was in escrow in Jefferson City. There had been a dispute about whether the rates could go up. This dated from 1930, I think. I didn't hear about it until about 1935. And uh, by that time, my, my very good friend and many times business partner, uh, Emmett O'Malley, was the uh, commissioner of insurance for the state. And um, 
I told uh, this gentleman that, yes, I thought probably something could be worked out. Uh, he suggested a small consideration, $500,000. I thought, I told him I thought that was, actually, he, he, that's what we agreed on. He started lower, and I didn't agree with him on that, but we got to that sum. And uh, it didn't happen all at once. But I did visit with Mr. O'Malley, and we were able to work out an, uh, an agreement. Now, I did nothing that was illegal in, in any of that. But there's some view that this might have been called a bribe. Well, I'm not a public official, you see. Now, I suppose... And no, no influence on the political process, either. Well, but they, I suppose that the issue would be that uh, you, what would happen is that O'Malley might have been taking a bribe. And I did make sure that he got some of the money. The generous man that you are, yes. Yes, well, I also shared it with McCormick that brought the money to me, too. Abs absolutely. I wanted him to be happy. He was, he kept coming. Absolutely. And, but, and, and perhaps the IRS, apparently, even if it wasn't strictly illegal from a, a, a political and, uh, point of view or a, a bribe, the IRS frowned on the fact that you had failed to report this 500 or I, I heard it was 750 thousand dollars but in any case no that's what this, they offered that oh all right okay but w the, the amount of money that you actually collected whatever whatever that was uh that you there was about four hundred and thirty thousand dollars i know what came in you uh, you you, uh, you 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 checked it with uh, commerce bank where you deposited absolutely uh and uh not here in the old First National Bank. No bank. checks involved in this. No, though. it's all it's cash, all cash. Trans cash transactions. Right. That's kind. Uh, but the IRS frowned on the fact that you had failed to report it to them. I thought it was very narrow-minded of me. <laughs> you see, I had a need for this because I had not had a good run with the ponies lately. And I needed to kind of get squared away with a few fellows I knew back on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, there, there, there are some reports that, uh, that some of this cash was delivered to you and was counted out in the basement of your Ward Parkway house. Well, it was an instance. Uh, the, when the main part of the money came, uh, Mr. McCormick did come to the house, and uh, we, uh, I, I counted it out, and uh, I had a little safe down in the basement and put it there, and the next morning uh, I took it to your uncle. God bless you. Uh, not, there's good in everyone. Uh, now, ultimately, the, uh, the, the United States government convicted you of uh, not, uh, not reporting your income, and, and you, did, uh, you did take a little trip up the river, so to speak, and in this case, really up the river to Leavenworth, and uh, uh, it, 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 you, you wrote a letter. I, I have to inject a personal note here. You wrote a letter to my great uncle, uh, or uh, to, the, to the judge, actually, referring to my great uncle, saying that you, you were not in, in, in good health as, as you were uh, 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 languishing there in, in uh, Leavenworth, uh, and that you, you identified my great uncle James Kemper as, as potentially your parole officer. Um, <laughs> uh, it was a great moment in our family history. Um, I, trust, I trusted your uncle. Yeah, and, 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 and we, pre we appreciated that, but uh, uh, during that period of time, Harry Truman, who was then the Vice President of the United States, a Senator and then the Vice President of the United States, stuck with you. And that, that's really kind of extraordinary because he, he, uh, he, he, had nothing, he had nothing to gain and everything to lose by, uh, by continuing to be your friend. How did, how did you feel Well, about Harry, that? Harry was a uh, Senator at that point, and actually uh, he had a very rough uh, re-election campaign in 1940 because I had been to Leavenworth. I was back out by that time, but as you may recall, my parole requirement was that I would have nothing to do with politics. I'd not go to 1908 Main Street. Um, and uh, s as a result of that, um, Harry, uh, I thought, was very creative. He, he moved his campaign headquarters in 1940 from Kansas City to Sedalia. And, and he ran for re-election. Of course, it was very helpful also that the two people running against him in the Democratic primary were two people who were fighting over which one of them had put me in prison. Maurice Milligan, who was the federal district attorney, and uh, Governor Lloyd Stark, uh, ingrate. Absolutely, you helped him to helped him to, uh, become become governor. Never trust an apple grower. 
Absolutely. Stark, stark apples. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to, to wrap this up a little bit and then open this up to questions from the audience, but I'd, I'd like you to, 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 to think uh, for a second and tell us what you think your legacy is. Now, now at, there's a famous uh, line that Harry Truman had after he'd uh, uh, become president of the United States and you had, you had, had passed on into your current uh, interesting state. Uh, and, and, but he, he, went, he went to the, the, uh, the meeting at Potsdam and he, and he, met, uh, he met the great world leaders and, and he said after meeting uh, the uh, dictator of the Soviet Union, he said, Joe Stalin reminds me of Tom Pendergast. <laughs> and I took yeah. that as a great compliment. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. And, and I thought, you know, you, you, you certainly had control of Kansas City, perhaps in the same way that Joe Stalin had control of the Soviet Union. What, what is your legacy today? What, 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 what would you like the citizens of Kansas, how would you like the citizens of Kansas City to remember you? Well, I really would like to be remembered as somebody who cared about the people of Kansas City. I don't know that anybody has put together uh, before or since the number of people that I did whose primary purpose was to do exactly that to look after the people of Kansas City. Now, they were to encourage them in certain actions along the way, but when somebody had a problem, they could go to one of my precinct uh, fellows, one of my ward healers, or they could come and see me at 1908 Main Street, and something would get done. You didn't have to go to five layers of bureaucracy to get your personal needs taken care of if you had an honest concern. I'd write you out on my little yellow pad with a red pencil, a note to somebody, and they would get you the groceries or the coal or whatever you needed. So I think the goodwill of the people of Kansas City who needed that goodwill is the first and foremost thing. But the other part of it, I guess I would have to say, is look around Kansas City. Even today, as you say, I've kind of floated around in my ethereal state, Look at the buildings in Kansas City, here in downtown. How many of those buildings are a result of the 10-year plan? And how many of them got built within about a three to four year period like those buildings got built? I don't think you're going to find it anywhere else. You may find bigger buildings. You may find some really glassy buildings. But uh, you're not going to find that many put together. So I think that both in terms of what I did for the people and what our organization was able to do in putting the people to work and leaving something of a lasting contribution is pretty important. Well, am I, am I to believe that you, you want to tell Mayor Funkhauser that development is political? <laughs> He's a fool if he doesn't think so. <laughs> and we won't, we won't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs>